Hello folks, so I'm Paul, as Dan said, and this is my talk on uh, creating friendly layers and it's the 2022 edition. Um, there's quite a lot of material in the slides. Um, I'm probably not going to have time to cover every single bullet point in this talk, but the slides are available as reference material as a PDF. Up. I have made some slight tweaks, so there'll be a new PDF up after this talk. Um, so yeah, let me start off by giving you a very quick about me. I've been involved in the Octo project in various different ways since around 2013, and I work across the whole embedded stack, so build system, kernel, U-boot, um, everything really. I'm currently working as principal engineer at a small company called SandCloud Limited. I've got my email address there and my Mastodon account there because I am no longer on Twitter. So find me on Mastodon if you want opinions on tech. Um, a brief bit about my employee SoundCloud. So um, we make custom and off-the-shelf embedded and IoT hardware. Uh, we've got our cloud-hosted or on-site IoT platform called Soundtrack. We are very open source focused. Um, so I won't spend any more time on that. So this talk, this is an updated edition of a talk I gave in 2019. Um, I've updated this to be in line with the Kirkstone and Langdale releases. Um, and this is a talk for anybody who needs to create or maintain their own layer, whatever type of layer that is. I'm going to cover what friendly layers are and why friendly layers should be a thing. Uh, and I'm going to discuss some best practices. So what layers you should use uh, as examples to learn from, uh, some methods and some examples to follow. Um, and then I've got some passing details for some of the comp files if I have time for that. Um, so there shall be no victims with this talk. I won't be showing any examples of bad practice today. So I'm sorry to disappoint you all. Uh, you will just have to imagine your own examples of dumpster fires. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the right way of doing things here. So what do I mean by a friendly layer? Um, so the first thing really is to say that simply adding a layer into your build uh, shouldn't change the functionality, shouldn't change what you get out of the build. That's a really important principle. Um, and it's an easy one to neglect. But, you know, following this does make it much easier when you're combining lots of different layers together. Um, and a friendly layer is also a layer that doesn't assume that you're building for a particular machine, that you're building for a particular distro. It should be uh, flexible and allow the person using your layer to uh, use it in their builds appropriately. Uh, friendly layer has careful use of BB appends, so you try not to tread on people's toes. Um, you make things configurable. Um, avoid clashing with recipe names in existing layers. So before you add a shiny new recipe to your layer, you can, for example, go and look at the layer index and search for the recipe name that you're planning on using and check that you're not clashing with something that somebody else is using in another layer. And another thing is if you've got any sort of Python helper functions that you use in various places, um, avoid littering the, the global namespace. Don't put them in a class that's forcibly included in everything or do something else in a comp file that um, forces those functions to be defined everywhere. Place them in a lib directory and import them where you use them. Um, so, you know, with those things said, why should you care about friendly layers? This just sounds like more work. Um, well, if, if you want the Yocto Projects compatible badge, um, it's a requirement to follow most of the things I just said. And um, these are things that are checked by the Yocto check layer script. Um, it also makes it much, much easier to integrate your layer with other layers. So when someone's building a product and using a layer that you provide, um, you know, maybe it's a machine support layer, B BSP layer, maybe it's a distro layer, it's less likely to cause conflicts if it's been built with the idea that it should be compatible and easy to combine. Um, it's easier to test and debug builds if you can quickly turn features on and off rather than having to add and remove entire layers to change functionality. 
Um, and friendly layers can also reduce the number of different layers that you need to create. So, you know, can you check the machine that you're building for and use overrides instead of having separate layers for every machine you need to maintain? The same with features. Can you define some features and check those instead of having to separate things into layers? So I think overall, it actually simplifies development of your layer in order to make it friendly. And the one thing people sometimes say is, well, you know, can't you just dynamically set BB layers and, you know, add or remove the layer uh, based on some conditional? Uh, well, in a multi-config, you can't do this. So if you want a multi-config multi build where um, part of the system is built for a different machine for another part or built with different features for another part, you can't really add or remove things to BB layers within those multi-configs. You need one set of layers that apply for all of those configs within the multi-config. You can't um, actually do anything dynamic in bblayers.conf to uh, dynamically choose layers based on variables in local.conf or on some other layer. Um, when bblayers.conf is passed, it doesn't even know what machine or distro um, is set. I may not know what machine or distro is set, there's some caveats there. Um, and there are some parsing limitations in bblayers.conf, which I will discuss later if I've got time. Um, you can dynamically create bblayers.conf for each build, um, but that does mean another, you know, another piece of tooling to maintain on top of a uh, Yocto project that needs to kind of pre-prepare the, the build environment in a different way for different product builds you're doing. So the, the recommendation here is, you know, if, if your layer can be configurable with features or with machine, um, and then you can just have a single list of layers for your entire build, that makes life a lot, lot simpler. Another thing I would say when I talk about friendly layers is building a friendly community around your layers, particularly when you start to get more adoption and, and start to see more people using your layers. Highly recommend providing some decent documentation. Uh, yes, for developers writing documentation can sometimes be a pain, but it does pay itself back pretty well. Um, and definitely provide clear contribution guidelines. Um, you know, how do you want people to send patches? Where do you want people to report issues? If you've got a large number of people interacting with your layer, then uh, you may benefit from adopting a code of conduct uh, to, to manage that community. And I would also highly recommend that you use inclusive language wherever possible. Um, layers to learn from. So I've listed a couple of layers here that I think are really good examples of friendly layers. Um, and if you're looking for how to do things, I would recommend digging through these layers and seeing how they do things. Um, so now I'm going to go through some of the things I've said in a bit more detail, um, because that was kind of a, a whistle stop tour of everything. So I'm going to give some best practices in different areas. And this is probably the bulk of the, the talk. So for documenting your layer, um, first of all, you definitely need a readme. I think that is always a requirement. Uh, and this should clearly identify the licensing for your layer. As I've said, you should clearly identify how to contribute, um, any uh, support forums, mailing lists, or email addresses that are relevant for people to contact. Um, to add some more documentation than that, I would consider adding a docs folder to the top level of your layer. Um, this is something we did in Meta Raspberry Pi, I believe, using Sphinx. Um, and you can, if you use uh, Sphinx, which is also what I believe is used by Yocto Project itself, uh, you can publish documentation to read the docs. Um, so you don't need to maintain your own web server for um, compiled documentation, you can use that to host it. So I think that's a really good idea. So you start adding more uh, detailed documentation to your layer on sort of what variables you support and what configurations you support. Layer.conf is a file that is used to specify settings for your layer um, that are global in 
nature. And they really are global. Anything you set in layer.conf will apply for all recipes, not just those in your recipes, but every single recipe in a build that includes this layer. Um, it's also often can be quite difficult to override things that are set in a layer.conf file. Um, it's passed very early during the uh, bit bake parsing process. Um, and it's passed in uh, BB layers order, not BB file priority order. So you may see that you can set a priority for your layer, um, but the, the priority is set, priority is set within the layer.conf files. So the actual pass order needs to be determined before the layer priorities are known. Uh, so this is a little different to the priority ordering of recipes. So what you really need to do is keep layer.conf as simple as you possibly can and try to try not to put unconditional things in layer.conf because they become quite difficult to manage when you're combining, uh, you know, 10 or so layers. Um, adding, if you're adding new content in layers, so new content is typically where it's quite safe to add things. You know, if you're adding new recipes or new classes, new machines, new distros, it's usually fairly safe. I would say watch out for name clashes. You know, if you're adding a new machine, uh, check that that machine name isn't used in another layer somewhere because it will then be quite difficult for someone who tries to combine those two layers. Where things can be a little more tricky is when you're modifying existing recipes. And by modifying, I mean using BB Appends mostly. And this is where you can definitely cause problems. I would say don't indiscriminately modify variables and tasks. I'll show a couple of ways you can do things in uh, using overrides and using conditionals um, in some further slides. Um, if you can, check the machine that's being built for, check the distro, check the various feature variables and do something conditionally on those rather than just having an unconditional assignment in a BB append file. And as I say, this allows whatever modifications you're doing within a BB append to be turned on and off by some form of configuration without having to actually remove your layer from the build when that feature isn't wanted. One thing that we've um, improved in recent releases of the Octo project is that by default, network access is now disabled outside of uh, the do fetch tasks. So things like a, a script that gets called in a do compile stage um, by default will not be able to access the network to pull more um, files down. Um, I would say if you want your layer to be friendly, don't override this, especially don't override this for the sort of core do configure, do compile, do install. It's likely to break things like license compliance tooling, source archival tooling, and many of the tools that people use with the Octo project. So yes, you can override this, but please try not to. Another thing I would say to use with the height of caution is the remove um, statement for variables. Um, so the way that, that variables happen is when you have an append uh, that gets added onto the end of a variable and all the appends get processed. And then after all the appends are processed, removes are processed. So remove essentially takes precedence over append. You can't, if, if uh, something is listed in a remove, you can't just add it back with an append. It's very difficult to undo a remove. So I would say avoid using remove if at all possible, use it as a last resort. So let's move on to overrides. So you can extend overrides based on a variable. Uh, so you have overrides for a machine or overrides for a distro, um, but you can actually extend this um, to have other types of, of overrides. Um, and this allows you to use the override um, syntax in variable assignments. 
Uh, if you do this, I, I highly recommend documenting your new variable in your README. Um, so let's say, for example, you have a variable called option that can take you know, value A or a value B, and you want to modify a source URI based on uh, the value of this option. It's quite easy to define, uh, to extend the overrides variable. And then you can have these option dash A and option dash B overrides that you can use within an append. So this lets you modify variables based on the value of some option in quite a neat way uh, and saves some quite messy syntax. And a good example of this is the way that toolchain overrides are handled in the meta clang layer that sub adds support for the clang compiler. So this um, sort of first kind of complex line here um, defines a new override that is uh, toolchain dash and then the value of the toolchain variable. So this would by default be GCC, um, but it can be clang if you're using clang. And then we go through and override all these variables um, where, for this toolchain clang override. So this is a nice way of rather than having to have conditionals in every single one of these variables, um, you can handle it quite neatly with overrides. Um, and this is one way of making things you know, quite neat um, and quite friendly for people to use. As well as overrides, we have features. And in a lot of cases, using features can be tidier than uh, messing around with overrides, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so we have distro features, which are typically set based on a distro in a distro.com file. We have machine features, which are typically set in a machine conf file. And we also have image features. Uh, one variable that's really useful is combined features. And this is essentially an intersection of things that are defined in both distro features and machine features. So this can be something like, it's used for things like Bluetooth, where it may be your machine supports Bluetooth, but you also want to say whether your distro does or not. Um, so use these features, uh, write code that, um, you know, in your BB appends, rather than having something unconditionally adding Bluetooth support, you can use your BB append to uh, check whether Bluetooth is in combined features before you actually start uh, modifying what the recipe is going to do. And that's going to make it much, much easier to combine your layer with other layers. Um, so a little more on the conditional syntax. So um, you can use Python expressions. Um, anywhere really. Uh, I'll just flick forward to give you an example of what this syntax looks like. Uh, the dollar at and the function um, for this function bbutils uh, contains. Um, the syntax looks like this. So where you would have require and a file name, you can instead have this kind of expression. Um, and bbutils contains essentially says is uh, check values a subset of variables. So it lets you say, does a variable contain um, one or more check values? So you can easily go through, um, you know, bbutils contains to check whether distro features contains a particular distro feature, and then require a configuration file if um, that distro feature is enabled. And let's say you need to modify, you know, 10, 12, 15 different variables based on something distro features. Um, you can have a simple .inc file, which unconditionally assigns things. And you can have this conditional inclusion rather than having to have a conditional on every single um, variable assignment in your uh, recipe. And this, you know, keeps your code quite neat, makes it easier to maintain. Um, and here also it's worth thinking, uh, mentioning the difference between include and require. So require um, throws an error if the file that you try to require is missing. So I would say you almost always want to use require over include. 
um, unless it's for an optional config file that you're expecting, you know, might be there or might not do. Um, or if you're including a file which is defined in another optional layer. Um, so it includes silently ignores missing files. So make sure that is what you want to happen before you just use include. So let's try to give some examples of this. Um, so looking at meta virtualization, um, the BB append files for some recipes in this layer need to have virtualization in distro features to have effect. So this means adding the meta virtualization layer into your build doesn't modify your kernel build configuration automatically. You need to add the virtualization distro feature before these ch um, configuration changes happen. And then this is actually implemented in a BB append file via conditional inclusion. Um, so there's a virtualization.inc file, I think it's called, that is conditionally included. Um, and then you don't need to have distro feature checks within the .inc file. So that's a good um, place to look if you want an example of how to use this. Um, another place is conditional inheritance. So inherit is when you're trying to pull in a BB class file. Um, and again, you can do things conditionally. Um, so in meta integrity layer, which is a subset of meta security, they have a kernel dash mob sign BB class. And then um, this is conditionally inherited based on a mod sign distro feature. Um, so that's quite a useful trick to use as well. Um, another thing I want to cover is adding build time checks to your layer. Um, so if you really need to limit your layer to only building for a particular machine or only building for a particular distro, um, don't just assume that those variables are set to what you want them to be set to. Uh, you can add a build time check that will give a warning or an error or even a fatal error if you really can't continue, um, if your layer can't handle um, one of those values being different. Um, an example of a check for which uh, gives a warning is the meta virtualization layer actually has a check to see whether this virtualization distro feature has been enabled. Um, and if you haven't enabled the distro feature or set this skip uh, variable to one, uh, then it will give you a warning just to make sure you are aware that the meta virtualization layer doesn't enable functionality unless you've set that distro feature. Um, if you have more complicated needs for conditionals, um, you can use anonymous Python functions. So these are Python functions that go in a recipe or a uh, configuration file or a class that are evaluated at parse time. Um, and you've got full support for Python if statements, for loops, everything else. Uh, you can use the d.getVar function to check the value of a variable, and you can use d.setVar to modify variables. Um, so if you've got something that's a little more complicated than you can do in a one-liner, uh, this is a nice way of being able to um, support that. I would say use them sparingly, uh, but they are useful um, if you've got some more complicated uh, conditionals that you need. And I would say lean on these rather than hard coding things in BB Appends. Um, so uh, six minutes left, let's see what else I can fit in. Uh, so using classes to modify recipes. Uh, this is a better idea than hard coding things, especially a better idea than hard coding things in layer.conf. Um, if you need to apply a whole bunch of settings all over different recipes, don't do it in layer.conf, define a new class in your layer. Um, I would recommend not setting, not adding this to inherit in layer.conf or elsewhere by default. I would recommend documenting in your readme that the functionality is enabled by adding the new class to inherit in a local.conf or in a distro.conf. Um, so that's how you would enable functionality rather than just adding a layer. Um, 
and this is useful if you've got, as I say, if you've got similar modifications to make to many recipes, don't hard code them, put them in a class and um, inform people how to enable that class. One thing that is safe to do usually is uh, appending to BB class extend. Uh, you don't usually need conditionals here. If you need a BB append to do something like just add dash native to BB class extend, which will allow you to build a native variant of an existing recipe, uh, then this should be fairly safe to do. So this is a good uh, thing to do. Um, so another thing here when we talk about friendly layers is the Yocto check layer script. So this is a layer compatibility test script. Um, it provides lots of checks. So it checks whether a layer has a readme, checks whether things pass correctly, checks whether you have indicated which uh, layer series you're compatible with. It checks that we can get signatures for bit bake work. So that doesn't actually perform a build, but it checks that everything can be um, computed really. Um, and it checks the recipe signatures with and without the layer present and make sure that um, your layer doesn't unconditionally modify uh, those signatures. Um, you need to use conditionals, essentially. Um, so this is a really good script to check whether you, your layer is following best practices. And I would say put this in your um, CI uh, build scripts for your layer. Run the check layer script often. So to summarize everything I've said, essentially what you need to do is think about downstream developers, people who are using your layers. Think about how can they extend your configuration? How can they build on top of what you've done? How can they disable things that you've done? Because sometimes they will need to do that. Um, just as you shouldn't use remove, try not to do things in a way that forces people using your layer to use remove in order to disable things make things configurable. Don't assume the distro, the machine, or the target image that is being built. If you really have limited support, add a check, um, as I've discussed earlier. Um, so that's the bulk of the talk. I will quickly run through my two appendix slides, uh, because I think they're really useful information for people to have. Uh, so the bblayers.conf file is uh, passed first in a build. So it's passed before any layer.conf, it's passed before local.conf or any user config files. Uh, it's passed before uh, base.bb class is included. The bb layers variable within bblayers.conf is iterated as soon as that file is passed. So you can't, in your assignment for bb layers, you can't depend on any variables in any of the config files I've discussed above because they haven't been passed at the time that that variable is iterated. Um, you don't have access to Python lib directories from any layer during, while bblayers.conf is passed. So in bblayers.conf, you can't import anything. You can't even use oe.utils.conditional. Um, you can use bb.utils.contains, but the variables you've got access to are very, very limited. So this really says, you know, BB layers should be a very simple list, trying to make it um, depend on the contents of some variables is going to give you a difficult time. Uh, layer.conf files in all the layers, uh, they're passed in the sequence that they appear in BB layers immediately after BB layers.conf. So they're still passed before local.conf and everything else. Uh, and you still don't have access to uh, Python lib directories from any layer, including the current layer within. Uh, layer.conf file. So you can't import uh, Python helpers within local.conf either. Um, so those are just two useful uh, bits of passing detail, which I think uh, are quite informative for people. So pretty much bang on half an hour there. Um, I noticed there's been quite a lot in the chat, but I haven't been following it. Uh, do we have time for a couple of questions?